Hi, I'm Stuck, and I'm a cybersecurity expert here at TrueSec. And today we're going to talk a bit about the cybersecurity landscape and TrueSec's threat intelligence report for the year 2020. And to help me out with that, I got TrueSec's incident response technical lead Fabio Vigiani and Matthias Bolian, who is TrueSec's threat intelligence lead, with me. So, Fabio, what is this report all about? Yeah, so this report is basically a collection of all the information that we have about threats that we've seen during the year 2020 uh, from different perspectives. We got data from uh, uh, from our security operation centers where we do monitoring for our customers 24-7 for the many incident response missions we've done through, throughout the, the years and specifically for 2020 in this case. Uh, and then the research and threat intelligence work that, that we do uh, on top of that. So we put all that together and try to understand like trends and how the threat actors operate and how the campaigns look like uh, so that organizations can use that information to uh, improve their uh, detection and protection capabilities. Um, and we can also hopefully see like where this is going and even predict what's coming next. Okay, interesting. So what kind of cyber attacks have we seen over the year? Well, it's no surprise that the most common form of cyber attack is still ransom attacks. About half of the serious incidents Truce has been involved in has been one form or another of ransom attack. What's new in 2020 is that ransom attacks no longer just means ransomware. About half of the ransom attacks now also involves one form or another of data leak ransom. It's where the actors steal sensitive data and then blackmail uh, by threatening to release sensitive corporate data on the internet. And another driver in the uh, development is the so-called ransomware as a service, where ransomware gangs let affiliates do the actual entry and then they just deploy the ransomware. This can be an individual hacker who is the affiliate or whole professional teams that do it together and then they share the profit. Then other other big types of attacks that we see uh, are what we call business email compromise, uh, which are attacks that um, exploit compromised mailboxes uh, to hijack conversations about uh, monetary transactions, paying invoices and stuff like that. And then they they swap bank accounts or they direct payments somewhere else in, in different ways. Um, and then we have more generic campaigns that focus on just gathering access, whether it's uh, gathering usernames and passwords or gathering uh, access to compromised computers to uh, make them become part of a botnet, which is then uh, sold to other groups and so on. Okay. so. What kind of attack vectors have we seen in these cases? The most common is still phishing. Uh, it's been like that for a while now. It was the same types of trends in, in 2019, not a huge variation there. Uh, we see the distribution of attack types varies a little bit, uh, but still phishing is at the top. And then we have, we have a lot of uh, exploitation of services that are exposed to internet. We did see an increase in that, uh, especially as a consequence of uh, the COVID-19 situation is a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people had to start working remotely. So IT departments had to be fairly quick in providing those solutions for, for people working from home. That in itself increases the exposure of different services and applications. And as a consequence, uh, you know, there are more things to attack. So, so that is in itself an increase. Then we also have the fact that attackers are getting pretty quick at exploiting things that are exposed and are and are known to be vulnerable. Uh, you have a time, you know, between a patch is released until the exploit is produced and uh, either sold or publicly released and, and the time when it's actually being exploited in the wild. And that time is getting very, very short. So organizations have less and less time to patch what's known to be vulnerable. In 2020, we were also reminded of the dangers of uh, supply chain attacks with the solar wind breach. Now, supply chain attacks is perhaps the most advanced form of attack. And so far, we've only seen the major intelligence agencies perform something like that. So a supply chain attack is essentially attack on a major software vendor. And you then abuse the chain of trust and push out uh, malware 
through the update function of the software company. And that would probably be the most dire future threat if organized cybercrime gained the capacity to do real full-scale uh, supply chain attacks like these. The, the landscape is changing a bit. So who are the threat actors that we're looking at? Well, as I said, uh, the top threat would still be state-sponsored groups working for foreign intelligence agencies. But the second tier is the big organized crime rings, mostly operating out of Eastern Europe. And these cyber criminals are actually very sophisticated and they get even more innovative and methodical as the time goes by. Uh, these top ransom gangs, for example, they know exactly what data to go after and to hold ransom. They know what hurts a company and what is sensitive if it gets released on the internet. So that helps them both in their data leak ransom, but also in ransomware deployment, because ran deploying a ransomware on a big network can take quite some time. But if they know exactly what to go after, they can encrypt the vulnerable data much faster. Then we have the other side, uh, or the other types of threat actors, uh, which are the less sophisticated ones. Uh, they are becoming more, basically. That's the bottom line. And there are a few reasons for that. Uh, the ransomware as a service model has picked up immensely since the last couple of years. And uh, that is definitely something that facilitates operations conducted by less sophisticated actors because they have less things to worry about. They can basically be affiliates to a ransomware as a service program and, uh, you know, just make profit with very little effort, basically. At the same time, there is an increase in the access for sale market. So uh, you have actors that specialize in just gathering access and sell it over to other groups. And there are groups that don't have to bother about gaining access anymore. They can buy that and then conduct their own attacks from there. So that is also making it easier for less sophisticated threat actors. Then you have attack tools. Uh, basically, they're weapons. They, they are readily available today and they're very competent and sophisticated sometimes. Um, we see a lot of actors that use these tools and they are able to inflict a lot of damage very quickly, maybe gain full access in just a few minutes by running these tools. But then you clearly see that they don't really know exactly what they're doing because what they do next just doesn't make sense. So this is a clear indication that, uh, you know, these tools are obviously very popular and they really enable less sophisticated actors to conduct these attacks as well. So we have these two things, right? The, the sophisticated and, and um, effective and successful threat actors, they're getting even more successful and more sophisticated. And then you have all these uh, you know, less sophisticated actors that are just becoming more and more. But we are talking about ransom here, right? So could we talk a bit about the differences in the ransomware attack? Yeah, so in the last couple of years, a ransomware attack uh, or the, the methodology using ransomware attack has changed quite a lot. Uh, we talked today about big game hunting ransomware campaigns. Those are attacks where you don't just run ransomware on the first computer or, or set of computers that you compromise, but you ensure that you have, you have complete control of the uh, virtually the entire IT infrastructure. Um, and then you go and select um, the right targets to encrypt, uh, or you just select everything and then you encrypt everything at once. That's the that's the main shift in operations by the big uh, the ransomware groups. In uh, almost half of the cases where ransomware uh, campaign or where ransomware is deployed, uh, there is also data that is stolen. Uh, it's actually traded and then the threat actor threatens the victim to release it if they don't pay the ransom. That's what we call a double ransom, which can be either a separate ransom from the original one or sim simply two different factors to push the victim into paying that ransom, which is carefully selected uh, based on the systems that are encrypted, on the data that is stolen, and also on the revenue of the victim. Yeah, and nowadays ransom attacks can also be expanded even more to just general blackmailing like DDoS attacks now usually is accompanied with some form of ransom demand to cease the DDoS attack. And 
There are other forms of blackmailing too, like threatening to put an organization on their certain blacklist programs or that will manipulate search engine optimization so that their uh, organization won't be found or be found in bad circumstances. These are less sophisticated attacks and the technique usually involves much smaller ransom amounts, but for a smaller business, they can be quite scary too. So we talked about this earlier, you mentioned it earlier, uh, a term called big game hunting. Uh, could we talk a little bit what that means and how much money are we actually talking about? Yeah, so for big game hunting ransomware campaigns, we've seen those numbers going much higher than, than last year. Uh, we've seen numbers up to 35 million US dollars that have been requested for a ransom uh, against a single target. And that's when, you know, they're very careful in selecting the right data. We have this data, we know it's very important for you. Um, so we know that we can ask that much. And that's also based on how much money the company makes. The, they're getting better and better at figuring out exactly what the pain threshold for a company is. Uh, and their ransom requests are also helped by the fact that more than 60% of organizations affected by these big game hunting ransomware did not have proper backups so they could return their system without paying a ransom. So if I had an organization that, that I wanted to protect, what would I do to protect my organization? What would be your recommendation? The truth is many corporations still have much homework to do to secure the networks. But it's worth noting that of all the incidents TrueSec has been involved in in 2020, no one who were, had a successful attack against them had proper detection capabilities. And proper detection capabilities essentially means 24-7 monitoring. Exactly. We talk a lot about uh, the attack chain and, and how it looks like from, from an attack perspective. And that matters a lot in how you respond and detect things as well. Because uh, if you think about an attack, um, you have at the time where they breach the target, right? So that what we call the initial access, then that might not necessarily be used immediately. We talked about, you know, uh, access has been gathered and sold, or they simply have access to too many and they need to kind of prioritize. So there, there is a delay between the initial access and when they are actually active inside the compromised network. Uh, then when they start to get active, then you have the time uh, that it takes for them to take control of virtually the entire IT infrastructure. And that time in almost 60% of the cases is less than two hours. And that is way too short. Uh, so. What you do by implementing protections and, and mitigations, uh, you know, hardening your environment, uh, removing too much access from people and things like that. So all the things that we've always been talk talking about for years, uh, by doing that is that you are taking that time and it's making that longer because it will take yeah. them, uh, it will take them longer to go from the initial access to full compromise, right? Uh, but the reason that we talk a lot about detection is that even though you increase, you're increasing that time, you need to be able to see that you're breached within that time. Otherwise, it doesn't matter if it takes them two hours or two months. If you can't see what's happening, they will eventually succeed anyways, right? So having 24-7 um, detection capabilities is very important. And I say 24-7 because those two hours can happen uh, you know, at any time in the middle of the night or in the weekend. Uh, we actually see a lot of preference from, from the threat actor, especially ransomware gangs, choosing the weekend to start the encryption process because then they have, met, they have more hours until someone will notice that something is wrong. So having that trade-off is very important. Both protection and detection are very important. But if you need to choose one, you should probably start with detection so you can see what's happening. Okay, so if anyone wants to have this report, because it's a quite deep dive into the information that uh, TrueSec has found over the year 2019 and 2020, um, they should head over to the TrueSec website. And there's also going to be a link here in the description of this video. So make sure you head over to TrueSec.com to get the full report or click on the link here in this video. Until next time, I'll see you around and uh, stay safe.